So you guys, we have two mics. Where are they? Yes, yeah, see, the, see the men in yellow? So we only have time for... Oh, I'm just making a devil ears. I'm doing shit, man. Freaking when Stephen King does it, it's, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so we have time for like a half an hour of conversation with the man. So go up to the mic, ask a question, but we only have time for probably seven, eight, nine questions. So probably no more than about 45 of you should go up. No, five, six, seven, eight, nine of you go up there. Go ahead. I'll try to keep the answer short and then maybe we'll get a few more. Ask him only yes and no questions. <laughs> I stole that from you. You did. <laughs> Good evening, Stephen. How are you? I'm fine. I'm to your right. I'm Adam and it's a pleasure to meet you. A little, a little closer. Is that Bigger my glasses, right? maybe? Wave, jump up and down or something. Okay, I got you. I got you, man. Go ahead. So, uh, in all these page turners, there's still a lot of poetry. How do wow, you find? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do you find the balance, and how can you tell when the uh, the vocabulary is getting a little too onanistic? <laughs> did he say onanistic? He did, m meaning uh, onan being the fellow who is cursed for spilling his seed on the ground. But I spill mine on paper, so I'm okay. <laughs> No, nah, I don't. I don't. That would make for a very messy book. Let's not go there anymore. Look, the only thing you can do is you use your best judgment, you know, and I want to tell stories, but I love the language. I always have. I, I fell in love with, with books, uh, with novels when I was a young guy, and uh, I fell in love with poetry when I was in college. Uh, people like... Uh, Richard Wilbur, Hart Crane, uh, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, all, all the, these guys, um, the, the quality of the language being like something that you could eat with a spoon. And I don't aspire to be lyrical, I don't want to do that, but I want to write as well as I possibly can. Um, I don't want to get diarrhea of the mouth, I want to keep the story rolling, but I want to do it as elegantly as I can. I think that readers sort of expect that. So, the. And then when the thing is done, uh, you give it to people, and uh, particularly an editor. And w one of the things I'm asked sometimes about editing, the more successful that you get, the more important it is to listen to an editor who won't let you hang yourself in Times Square. So I try to do that, and uh, I remember what Hemingway said, you must kill your darlings. Well, that seems a little bit harsh. I'm not able to kill all my darlings, but I do some. Next. Let's do this mic now, yeah. Hi. Howdy. Hi. I'm talking to Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old you. How old are you? I'm 11 years old. Yeah, baby! That's good. You go with your bad self. What's your question? Um, what was one of your like best writing moments when you had your best idea and it just came to you? Oh man, what a great question that is. There have been a lot of times, you know, the thing is, I'm so lucky to be able to do this because you know, the thing is like, there are certain people in life where everybody else says, we have to grow up. You stay a kid and play in the playground. You'll be our designated playground person. And you go play and we'll enjoy what it is that you do. The, the best idea, in some ways, this is terrible to say, but I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, and uh, I was driving on the, 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 the Boulder-Denver cutoff, Route 36. And I was listening to a radio station in Arvada. It was one of these Bible shouters. I love those guys. No, I do seriously love those guys. I love the cadence of them. You know, the sort, it's a beautiful thing. And this guy was talking about some Old Testament book, and he's saying, once in every generation, the plague shall fall among them. And we were living near, uh, a, you know, a, a chemical warfare dump in that area, and there was a lot of talk about it. And I thought, what if there was a plague and it killed just about everybody? and there were only a few people left, and I thought to myself, I'm gonna write that, and that was just such a blast, and it turned into the stand. That was good. Hey, I just wanna know your name, 11-year-old human, because that's 
that took such chutzpah. How, what's your name? Von Suppel. Here's to Von Suppel. <laughs> Let's do that mic, yes. Hi, my name is Eileen, and I came in from Chicago to see you today. Nice. Because I think you're awesome. Um, my question is, I know... Home of Barack Obama. That's nice. correct. Nice. Um, yeah! Well, it's also home in Chicago, cuz. <laughs> I, I admire your creativity and everything that you write, and I was wondering if you'd ever consider expanding that creativity into something... Um, Useful. No. <laughs> I was thinking more of an event, like a Halloween event. We were at Universal Studios Horror Nights oh, this I see, year. Yeah. And we always ask them, how come you don't ever get Stephen King to come here and do something, create something uh, there? And they said, well, we've tried. And I said, if I ever get the chance, I'll ask him why won't he do it. <laughs> no pressure. They wouldn't want a ride I created. <laughs> because there would be no repeat customer. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Ben Bolger, and I appreciate you coming to UMass Lowell uh, to speak today. I was wondering if you could reflect on when you were a student at the University of Maine, and what you learned both in your classes and what you learned from writing for the student newspaper and how that shaped the development of you as a writer. Well, if you, if you want to be a writer, you really only have to do two things. You have to read a lot and you have to write a lot and you have to continue to get buzzed by what you're doing. You know, you have to continue to feel good about it. Uh, yeah, well, most writers do get buzzed, but I'm talking about a natural buzz. Why is she looking at me? <laughs> hey, listen, I didn't say it, you did. <laughs> but the thing is, you have to really like what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I remember when my son, Owen, who has his first novel coming out next year, is terrific. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have three kids. Uh, my daughter is a minister, and both my sons are novelists, and they both have novels coming out next spring. Um, Great. My son, my son Joe, uh, has a book called Nosferatu. Uh, he writes as Joe Hill, and uh, Owen has a book called Double Feature, which is uh, so funny that it's just illegal. But in any case, when Owen was a, when Owen was a little guy, he was this little round guy, and he was uh, bigger than his age group and everything, and uh, he felt kind of stupid and. The person that he fixated on was Clarence Clemens uh, from the E Street Band because, yeah, because yeah, Clarence was the big man, you know, and, and he, he blew the sax and he was cool and, and Owen wanted to be like Clarence and he said, can I learn the sax? And we were delighted because our other kids, you know, had the musical abilities of bookends. So we were glad when Owen wanted to learn the sax and Owen was very good and he practiced the sax and everything. But it was clear after a year or so that he just wasn't getting a buzz out of it. And so, you know, he stopped and he found something that he did get a buzz out of, and that was writing. That was kind of like the family business. So you have to like it. The thing about college and college writing classes, I mean, they can fuck you up as bad as they can <laughs> make things for you, you know? Okay? Because, because it's all subjective and sometimes you get bad advice on good work and sometimes you get, you know, good feedback on bad work. But the thing is, man, the good thing about it and the thing that makes it worthwhile is that people take this job seriously. And so often when you get out there in life, people say, you want to be a writer, there's no money in that. Jesus, well, unless you want to write green cards, that might work. So I think that it, college is an important place because it gives you a, a chance to grow. And, and people take seriously what you want to do. College is great because, you know, maybe there's a tuition cost, but the dreams are free, and that's a good thing. Nice, yeah.
First off, Mr. King, I would like to th say thank you to you for all oh. the pleasure you have given me oh over these God. years. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, all I can say is I'm glad it was good for you because it was, <laughs> it was great for me. <laughs> but I had racked my brains for months because this is a gift for my kids for my birthday for the question I was going to ask you. And it didn't come to me until tonight when you were telling the story of when you sold your rights to carry mm -hmm. and you fell on the floor knowing that you had that car that needed the repair. My question is, did you repair the car or did you buy a new one? <laughs> We bought a Ford Pinto. <laughs> no! You didn't! We did. <laughs> but you know what? Hey, listen. We love that fucking car. It was brand new. It was brand new. It had that smell, you know, that new car smell. And we've been driving all this junk, you know. Uh, listen, one of the first times that I ever dated my wife back in the old, you know, all those years ago, I'm driving around in this station wagon that I got from my brother, and we went over a bump, and the goddamn gas tank fell off. <laughs> right off in the middle of the street. And uh, there were some guys playing Legion baseball, and they, they were just totally, you know, drunk on their asses, but they came over and they wired up my gas station. <laughs> give it, yeah, give it. Yeah, baby, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because that's how we roll, but it, that car was so good. That's like the best car. Birthday, Mama, what's your name? Nora Happy birthday to Nora. Happy birthday. Hi, my name's Diane. Yep. Three of my favorite things are reading, the Red Sox, and one of the best authors I've ever had the pleasure and privilege <laughs> of reading, Stephen King. I happen to have a picture here of all three, which is a very young Stephen King leaning against the wall of a vomitorium in Fenway Park, <laughs> reading a book. I'm wondering if you remember what book you were reading in this picture. <laughs> Hand it down here. Hand it down here. We're going to see that you get it back, OK? That's a great picture. What is that? I think it's... Friends of Eddie Coyle. The Friends of Eddie Coyle. George V. By Higgins. George v. Higgins. You are wicked smart. <laughs> oh, God. Well, that's really weird because my name's Diane, too, so weird. Um, obviously, your writing's amazing, and I think it's awesome, and I brainstormed a million questions I could ask you about your writing, but I can't stand here and not ask you a question about the Red Sox. So, if you were the manager, or the general manager of the Red Sox, would you have re-signed David Ortiz? Poppy? Not re-sign Poppy? You'd be insane not to re-sign Poppy. No, 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 no. Trade Poppy and keep John Lackey, right? <laughs> no, of course keep Poppy. And if I can just be serious for a minute about the Red Sox, I think the smartest thing, a lot of people have asked me just lately, like I know anything, you know, uh, what I think about the moves that the Red Sox have made. And I really think that from a, uh, 
the standpoint of the management and the ownership saying, I want to make amends to the fans for the really terrible season last year. Resigning David Ortiz was the smartest thing they could have done because he's a goodwill ambassador. You know, not just to the baseball world, but to Red Sox Nation. Yeah. So I first have to say um, thank you to my brother. He wanted me to say a good hello to Stephen King. He's covering my shift tonight so that I was able to be here uh, with, 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 with my pregnant fiance who uh, now. And you also want to thank your cinematographer. Everybody and else. Uh, <laughs> cue the music and get me off the mic I'm just right shitting now. On you, man. So, Don't so, worry about it. Thank you. A literary buzz, as the theme has kind of been tonight. Uh, my question is we've been writing pretty hard for the last few months and had a lot of odd things happen. Um, I know you've spoken about you know, writing is magic and you've had a lot of malevolent almost forces trying to stop you from completing certain, certain things. So I'm just wondering if there's anything you can share here with us that's happened while collaborating either with someone uh, or on your own. Almost, I can't think of the qu right word, there might, I just have to make one up, but like a hallucinogenic, almost like seeing red for you know, um, something like that. Like a, mm -hmm. a dick-like experience, Philip, Philip Dick. Anything like that's happened to you? No. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, I'm not putting you down or anything, but no. How do you follow that? Uh, I'm up from Pennsylvania, nine hour trip on the road today. I'm sorry I missed the first 35 minutes of the talk. Um, my power went out for three days when we had that huge hurricane a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I read 11-22-63 yeah. by candlelight for three days and it took me away from everything that we were suffering from to 1958 to 1963. I thought that the uh, female teacher, Sadie. Sadie, baby. Sadie, baby. That's how love is. You forget her name right away. I loved her so much. As a creation of yours, she was just the most incredible female fictional character that oh, I. Oh, gosh, uh, don't stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, he and likes I, this. Keep talking. My question is did you set out, do you set out at the beginning of the book saying, I'm going to write an awesome female character in this book, or I'm going to make the best child, paranormal child that I've ever... No, I never do anything like that. I set out to tell a story and to try to make the characters as believable as I can. And with a, you know, it's a, with the case of Jake and Sadie, uh, I tried to write a, a love story that would be kind of like the way that people got together in the 50s with their feelings, their conflicted feelings about sex. And, and I, I just wanted to pour as much love into that relationship as I possibly could um, without, again, you know, this goes back to the first question about the language that you use. And, you know, I didn't want it to turn into a romance novel. I, I wanted to write something as true as I could about love. And it's such a a line to walk between what's true and in your heart and the sentimental and the mawkish and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to make it as real as I could. And what I wanted, what you always want, is for reader identification so that, so that the people, the guys who read that book will say, I would love to have a girlfriend like that. I would love to be in love that way. And have the women say, I'd love to meet a man like that. And if you succeed on that level, I think that it's, it's really good because I'm as much of a sucker for a love story, particularly if it's a little bit of a star-crossed love story as anybody else. Um, I got this reputation as a, uh, a horror writer and everything, but I've really got a marshmallow for a heart, so. <laughs> Hi, Steven. My name's Maeve. I'm Yo. Not, how you doing? 
I grew up way out in Wyoming, and I actually moved out here to go to, to go to graduate school in Boston. It was a big move for me, but I actually felt comfortable moving to New England because I'd read all of your books, and <laughs> I knew that it was okay in New England. I figured if Stephen King lives out here and everyone likes it out here, that it was okay to move this way. It's literally why I felt okay moving to Boston to come to school. So I did it, and I still live here. Yeah, but, I'm a New England ambassador. Come up and get sucked <laughs> by vampires. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go ahead. I, do, I do have a question. I, um, I, I first read uh, my first book of yours when I was 11. I read It. And great book. Great book. Yep. Scared the hell out of me. Scared the hell out of my little brother. Uh, terrified my family that I was reading it. And then I uh, read the rest of your stuff. And, um, but I felt a real connection to, to your young characters. And I noticed in all of your books that um, there's often a young character that's a protagonist that's an 11, 12, 13-year-old kid that takes charge and, and leads uh, through the book and is the one that, that solves, the, solves the mystery or, or takes charge and you know, mm -hmm. finds the talisman and brings it back and solves the, saves the day. And I've, just, uh, I've always wondered what it is um, about kids that you write so well and what it is that draws you to writing them as your protagonists in your stories. Well, with it, my kids were about that age when I wrote that book. And again, you know, they're the best uh, subjects for observation that you can possibly have. You know, I, I watched them, I saw how they operated in the world, I checked out their friends, uh, never in an intrusive way, I hope, uh, <laughs> but to try to be, you know, sort of supportive and uh, to listen to the talk. That, to me, that's like one of the most important things is to listen to how people talk. And the other thing is that I had noticed uh, as a, a reader that while there were books that were written for the so-called YA uh, audience, young adult audience, and there were books written for kids, and those books were about kids, there were damn few books that were written for grown-ups about kids, but why not? I mean, that's a valid part of our life. It's the launching pad for everything else. And what I really wanted to do with it was to write about how kids have a wider bandwidth when it comes to perception and belief and, and the ability to accept things and how when we become grown-ups, that field of vision starts to change and, and close down a little bit. And so, what I really wanted to do in it was to try to create a bridge, fictional and, and make-believe and scary. But childhood is a scary time. And I wanted to give adult readers a chance to relive those years as, as much as possible. So that's what I did. And uh, I'm fascinated by kids, by children. I think that it's a fantastic time of life. And I'm starting to sound like Michael Jackson, so I better shut up. <laughs> One more. Two more. Two more. I, I, I want to make one comment, though, because I think throughout your work is, is, is this universal quality. You, you always see compassion for, for kids and people who are hurting, old people, people who no one else pays attention to or looks at. And I really love that about Stephen's work, his compassion for people that no one else pays attention to. Well, thank you. Uh, mean it, brother. This your turn. We're, we're going to do two more, one from you and whoever fights for the mic over there. I'm, uh, I'm don't kidding. Fight. Don't fight. Hello, my name is Jeffrey, and I'm a huge fan, and I can't believe I'm talking to you. Oh, man. And I, can't believe I'm I was talking wondering to you either, if you've Jeffrey. ever been writing and you just like terrified yourself. Or... If I've terrified myself? Yes, and where all your characters go when you try to fall asleep at night. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't really have like bad dreams or anything because I pass all that shit on to you guys. It's great. <laughs> it's terrific. And I love that. But yes, I have scared myself. I, I wrote a book called Pet Cemetery, And uh, I got pretty scared t toward the end of that book, kind of, you know, oh boy, just uh, some of the things. It was very black. And uh, when I finished the book, I actually put it in a drawer because I didn't think anybody would want to read anything like that. But they did, so fuck them. Uh, I don't mean that. I have, the, I have the greatest respect in the world for my fans. But the time that I scared myself the most, 
I was writing The Shining, and uh, and and I had, I, it's like being, it's like being fucking Leonard Skinner, you know, <laughs> play Freebird. Yeah. That's totally elliptical, but never mind. Uh, what I started to say is I was living in a house, or rather, I, I had rented a room in a house that was away from the kids, uh, and I could go there for three hours a day, and I worked, and it was peaceful, it was in the Flatirons, and I worked for three hours and go home, and then I realized that uh, the, the young kid, Danny Torrance, was going to go up to this room, 217, and that there was a dead woman in the bathtub who wasn't really dead. And, uh, I was working away, happy as a lark, and then one day I thought, five days to room 217. <laughs> and then it was three days, and then it was one day, and then it was, I was in the room, and that was a very, very brilliant scene in terms of what was going on in my head. And I was very scared when I wrote that scene. I think that comes across. Now, we have one more question. Make it a good one. What? Uh, <laughs> oh, God, I don't know. No. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? I do have a question. After her question, and I'm going to walk you down. All right. Okay. Question. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, there's so many. Um, good evening. <laughs> Hi. Um, where do I begin? Do you carry a cell phone? <laughs> do I carry a what? A cell phone. I know you had said Shit, before. no. <laughs> no, actually, when I'm on a trip like this, I have one, but I, I left it behind tonight, and I don't know my cell phone number or anything like that. So you do, because I, I've listened to you speak before, and you said you'd never carry a cell phone, and that was the cell, and you swore that it was evil? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think they're evil, but I do think that there's something uh, creepy when you walk down the street. We talked about this, and you see 10 people, and seven of them are like this. <laughs> You know, something little. And think about it. Think about it. Think about how they lower your IQ. What's the first thing anybody says when they pick up the cell phone? Hey, where are you? <laughs> you don't think that's funny? Man, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but then maybe it's just sort of lost on me because I don't have a cell phone. Listen, you guys have been great to me, and I really appreciate it. It's like, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Don't forget the guy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. What are we going to do about the poster? We're going to sign chairs right now. Oh, okay. We're going to start this off. Oh, we got something that we got to do. We got to sign the chairs. Yay. Yeah, that's right. Well, before we do that, I know it's colder up in Mean than it is in Lowell, so we wanted to present you with a token of our oh, appreciation. Man. Wait a minute, the price tag's on it. <laughs> 55. <laughs> and a UMass Lowell Riverhawks hat. Nice. Stephen, because of your generosity, we have raised over $100,000 for scholarships for English students for UMass Lowell. Yeah. That's terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's terrific. Appreciate it. Thank you. And to, and to Andre Debuse, if I know there are a lot of young people here who are thinking, who love reading, who love writing. They're thinking about where to go to a college or university. Andre Debuse III is an example of the high quality that we have in our English department. Consider you, Matt Lowell. Andre, thank you for bringing Stephen here. Appreciate it. He Andre made this happen. Can I, can I just say one thing, too? Hey, 
<laughs> We're gonna get it. Hold on. Hold on. Hold, hold on. on hold on. Hold on. We'll, we'll get it. Marty Meehan, this is his kickoff uh, event in his in his the Marty Meehan Chancellor Speaker Series, and this is his brainchild. And uh, I just want to give a toast to Marty Meehan and all he's doing. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. I'll give it wait to you. a minute. I'll give it to you. What's your name? My name is Brandon. I got to tell you one thing before we go. Yeah, that's a, the American Insurance Association says that in a, any kind of a public gathering like this, 7% of the people who arrive in automobiles forget to lock their cars. And I'm not the one who wanted to say or would say that there's a maniac out there. But we know that such people do exist. And, I'm just suggesting that you check your back seat because you wouldn't want to look in your rear view mirror. You want to sign the chairs now? Or? Yeah. Okay. Now, Stephen is going to sign the chairs, but we have the uh, winning numbers. But I can't read them, so I have them enlarged here. But I better sign the chair first. And yeah, you got to sign too. the chair. I got it right here, here. Hold that. Hold, you want this one? Hold that. I signed a lot of shit, but this is my first chair. <laughs> so, Mr. King, if you will put your John Hancock right here. That's our plan. This is fun. <laughs> oh, man, this is going to look like somebody with a bad brain tumor. <laughs> <laughs> My, are we one, both signing both? Yeah, we're signing both. Let's go, baby. Oh. Look out, you'll get a rupture. You'll get a rupture. God, this is exciting to watch me sign a chair, isn't it? So we don't know how you're going to get these home. I got an SUV. You got a truck? Good. The winning number for the first chair is number 133156. That's my one, number. 133156. The second chair is 133479. Who do we got? The winner should go to the raffle ticket location near the Sal's uh, Concourse right up there. Two winners. I'll read them one more time. I just wanted to put Stephen King right there, man. One, three, three, one, five, six. One, three, three, four, seven, nine. By the way, we made five thousand dollars on the raffle for scholarship. Nice. Thank you very much. That's good. Last, the last message is that the Lowell Bank Pavilion is going to be open. If you want to have something to eat or a drink, we're going to be open up here for a while. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you, Stephen. Good luck, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, he was...